The crude in stills or retorts was heated up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, now it talks a bit about uh, dist distillation and it says gasoline was the first thing to come off. There was uh, little known use for it and for years it was known as the offal of the oil industry. Then came naphtha, benzene, runs of kerosene, lubricating oils, and paraffin. And finally, there were left tars and residues. Stills were scattered all over. Samuel Van Cycle recalled that he first became interested in oil while living in Jersey City. On the flats around the city were dozens of small stills. Noxious fumes floated into the city. Quote, almost every day there was an explosion somewhere from the gases. End quote. You want to go back to the good old days when things were, were, were safe and uh, there wasn't all this technology and, and industry and stuff around us. You know, you ask me, we're living in the good old days. This is the good old days right now. This is the golden era. Finally, the city's common council ordered a stop to the refining and Van Cycle came to Titusville. Uh, at first, the refining process was so inefficient that there was only a 55% yield of kerosene from crude. But this could easily be increased to 65% by mixing in some naphtha or gasoline. The user of such adulterated kerosene stood a good chance of being burned by an explosion. It's more explosive but more efficient. With the first three years of the life of the new industry, it learned of the curse of overproduction and ruinous prices. Now, overproduction in the early years of an industry is just everybody is, who rushes in there has to realize they're going to make it or break it in here. You've got a hundred producers. Five of them are needed. Ninety-five aren't. Just everybody go, who goes in and tries knows that. So you can't cry for the people who overproduce. They get stuck with a commodity that's worth nothing. There's only a few companies that have enough capital to make it through this and come out the other end when prices come back up. And, you know, boo, boo hoo. So, so, so 95% of the companies go broke. Every company that was opened was opened voluntarily. But anyways, off my soapbox and back to the quotes here. Within the first three years of the life of the industry, it learned of the curse of overproduction and ruinous prices. Oil started out at $20 a barrel, but by the spring of 1860 was $12. It continued to slide. By the end of 1861, it was $0.10 cents a barrel. Now, that's because no one had a damn thing to use it for. Everyone said, everyone who had any use for it had, had a two-year supply. Um, so they were like, so at this point, I want you to realize this isn't a catastrophe or disaster. At this point, people have stockpiles of oil, and they, they thought it's a valuable commodity, right? People use lamps and burn lamps and read at night and stuff. But then they realize, we've got a lot of oil here. Now, people who are on top of it are going to say this is a new industry. There are all kinds of things we can do with this. There's a massive oversupply of a commodity that we now need to figure out a use for and get people to pay us you know, to be in this business. They need to figure out a way to market their commodity because they found that they have a gargantuan amount of a commodity. That's all that tells you. The fact that it dropped to 10 cents tells you you need to open up new markets and find new ways for people to be benefited by this. But that is amazing that it fell from $20 to 10 cents. So the, the price fell 95% in one year. Uh, a barrel weighing 70 pounds was 20 or 30 times more valuable than the petroleum within it weighing 300 pounds. Production, discouraged by such low prices, fell in 1863 and 1864. So they, they produced so much oil in a very, very, very short period of time uh, that for about two or three years that, that they had more than enough. This is during the Civil War. Now perhaps if it were peacetime there might have been more uses found for it, but maybe not. This is a summary of the situation in the oil fields at the beginning of 1863 when John D. Rockefeller, a successful commissions merchant of Cleveland, branched out into oil business. As a resident of Cleveland, he had, beh he had beheld with wonderment the quick growth of the new industry. 
a new economy, a new land, uh, John D. Rockefeller enters the picture. So right now we've been setting the stage. This is the stage that Rockefeller looked at. So he's not like, he, he's kind of like Henry Ford. Henry Ford did not invent the automobile. Okay? He didn't even really invent the assembly line. He just made it work. He made it an institution no one would ever ignore again. Um, so the automobile is there for several years and, and finally Henry Ford comes along and tries his hand at it and after uh, nearly a decade he gets a pretty good vehicle and, and then he becomes known the world over for the automobile Henry Ford. That's fine. John D. Rockefeller like, likewise was not there the day the first oil well was drilled. He came in later after a lot of people had opened up the industry, invested their money, got lost, left the industry, he comes in later and, and he kind of brings order to chaos. And we're going to visit with him. So now we're going to go to chapter 2. We're on page 19. So Rockefeller was born in Richford, New York, July 8, 1839, during the administration of Martin Van Buren. That's all we need from that page. Uh, just to get that fact, I mean, it's a you know, try biographical facts that ought to be included, hadn't it? When Rockefeller was eight, his father took him to the great city of Syracuse, where he saw the iron monsters moving on tracks and belching forth steam, and he observed the hustle and bustle of the metropolis of 20,000 souls. From that day stemmed his desire to belong to the city rather than the country. September 26, 1855 was a day always marked by Rockefeller, because it was in that day, after weeks of pounding the pavement, that he landed his first job with the firm of Hewitt and Tuttle on Merwin Street as an assister bookkeeper. Pounding the pavement, you know, means walking after going door to door. No pay was mentioned, but in January he was paid $50 for three months' work and was then put on a salary of $300 a year. Looking back years afterwards, uh, Rockefeller saw that the experience he gained in this firm was extremely, extremely valuable to his future career because his work was done in the main office. Uh, he was almost always present when the partners discussed their affairs. Besides its regular commission business, the firm owned private residences, warehouses, office buildings, and it was Rockefeller's job to make up the, and deliver the bills, collect the rents, and adjust claims. He had to learn to get along with all types of clients and customers, and maintain satisfactory relations with his employer. It was an education in what he later said was the most important quality for business success, the art of getting along with people. The most, he said the most important quality for business success. He was in a neighbor's office when a plumber presented a long bill. And the businessman, now we're just giving context, so a different, different subject here, with a, quick, with a quick glance the businessman said, pay it to his clerk. When the same plumber presented his bill to Hewitt and Tuttle, Rockefeller, checking it item by item, found discrepancies and saved money for his firm. Slovenly methods of doing business were not for him, he decided. Careful auditing of all bills, big and small, became a cardinal tenant of Standard Oil Company. Rockefeller worked for the firm until March 1859, a few months before Drake struck oil. Uh, the time of employment was three and a half years. He asked for a raise of $800 a year, but the best that Hewitt would do for him was $700. The difference of $100 set Rockefeller to looking around for another opportunity. Uh, you won't give me that last 12.5%? Sayonara. Maurice Clark, an Englishman, had come to America to escape prosecution for assaulting his employer. He had moved around before coming to Cleveland, and like Rockefeller, had attended Folsom's Business College. By dint of hardy industry, as an employee in a commission house, he had saved $2,000. He proposed to Rockefeller that they go into partnership in a wholesale commission business in produce, grain, meats, hay, salt, lime, and other goods in which they could act as intermediate for a profit. So they would buy massive quantities of goods, put them in warehouses, and go around and say, I've got this, do you want to buy some? I've got this, do you want to buy some? Rockefeller asked his father for a loan of a thousand. Um, because his father had promised to give each of his sons a thousand when each reached uh, his majority, he 